Obviously, at some point, a decision is made to make the school more SEND friendly and to push on down that route. Can you talk a little bit about the point that you made that decision and, and why you chose to well, make it? Well, if you have a school, of course, you have a whole range of children. And it's very easy uh, to say, well, we'll just work with the ones that are, you know, work well for us and they get good results. But of course, that's not our purpose. So I see deep down is there's a, there's a great uh, a moral purpose in actually having a, an SEND friendly school. Every child has needs at certain times. Um, there is a group of children who are in that particular category, but every child is, um, has needs and therefore our school is based around the needs of the individual. Now once you've got the concept of the individual, then specific individuals become an obvious route to look at. What did you find were the main barriers to bringing about best practice? Well, the barriers are, there are uh, league tables in the country. Now, league tables are fine. I'm not, a, not, not somebody who says they're no good, because I think they probably are a market force which helps in some ways. But here's the challenge, of course. Some of the children we're talking about don't feature very highly initially on league tables. So you have to really get over that cultural thing, and you need to do that with governors, trustees, and with staff. And I think the important thing is to talk with staff absolutely clearly about what are we here for. Now, we're here for whoever enters the door. That's what we're here for. And we have a duty, a responsibility, but also, you know, as human beings, you want to help everybody. And that needs to permeate every inch of the school. What are the most effective actions that a school leader can take to bring about good SEND provision throughout the school? Well. You've got to have this notion that every child matters and you can talk about things a lot in schools but you've got to have actions. So the actions that the leader needs to show that they too believe that every child matters. So if you are building something, if you're changing something, in that discussion will always be a discussion about how will that be accessible for every child. Whether that's a child with a physical disability, a learning disability, whatever it might be, any challenges that a child has, whatever we must do, we must make it accessible to everybody. So for and, we could use like also and other And words. also is a better word than and. Yeah. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. and for do you like writing? Yeah, I like writing. Good. Yeah. Anybody else got something to add to this? Or are you, is that, has he got it about right? He's got it about right. That's fantastic. You keep going. This group is a, a focus group work group, so these are clever children who need to just focus on learning um, some of the skills of writing. And these children are very, very... Um, uh, it being in these groups allows them to have an opportunity of a teacher who tutors them. This is a tutorial way of doing it, but what we've seen is these are as enthusiastic and are driven, but are doing work at a slightly different way than the rest of the class. But the important thing is they're doing exactly the same lesson, exactly the same learning objective. What we're changing is the teaching style. In many schools, with children with these sort of uh, abilities, what we're tending to do is lower our expectations. And once you've done that, you've institutionalized failure. And these children, interestingly, last year, 52% of these children who may well have under traditional methods not done as well, 52% of them exceeded the expectations nationally, which puts the value added for a school. So if a school needs a reason, and value added shouldn't be the reason just because it's a score, but if you want a score, this is how you get the scores. How easy is it to identify the, the key areas that require improvement? Well, what you've got to do is it's every day, every second of every moment, you're looking and trying and working out. Now, what we do is we have an, uh, an element in our, all of our meetings in school. The first element, uh, first item on every agenda, or any meeting, is pastoral issues, because we're about children. The second one is how can we improve? Now, people say to me, how can you discuss improvement at every meeting? Well, you can't always improve at every meeting, but it does enter into school the culture that this school can improve. So it's, get, it's a cultural thing, this. This is actually getting right at the hub of it, and this is where leaders lead, because a lot of teachers, a lot of head teachers, spend most of their time managing. 
managing things. It's easier to manage things because things can be moved and tend to do as they're told. Concepts are hard to get across to people, so you have to talk about it a lot, you have to understand it, and also you have to find like-minded people on the staff. You promote people, I'm not physically promote, but promote them as people in school who understand these things. And there are other things that you can do in assemblies, when you're talking to children, when you actually ask children to stand up and make sure that you are inclusive and all of those things. If you demonstrate it as the leader, it becomes the culture of the school. In any process of change, there's always a bit of resistance. How do you deal with that? Well, resistance is fine, and uh, a full and open and frank discussion about it, I think, is fine. I think it was Brian Clough said, you know, we have a full and frank discussion, and then they do what I ask. Now, it isn't quite as simple as that, but what you do, actually, there, they, we would not be able to employ anybody in the school that didn't believe that every child matters. And if we had a discussion with somebody who, you know, openly said, actually, they're a group that don't matter, that would be a full and frank discussion. But what our debates are about is how we can achieve these aims. And those discussions are worth having and very valuable to have. And I think you create in the culture in the school is discussion, challenge is, all, is fine. The principle is non-negotiable. What tips do you have for inspiring and motivating staff to make the changes? Well, I think the real thing is, of course, the, the value that the school puts upon what success is. Now, I mentioned earlier that league tables are one measure of success, but schools need to have other measures of success. So we talk about the children that have challenges and what great successes they've made. If they're tiny, whatever it is, we bring those into our discussions at staff meetings, in the staff room, at formal meetings, and make those have high value in the institution. So the child who could not read and now has been able to stand up in assembly and rather you know, stutteringly say something is treated with the same value as the child who's written five pages essay on something. But the leadership, come back to leadership all the time, you need to say these things matter. And of course you encourage that and once you encourage it, people's behaviours change. Their behaviours change to what is accepted, valued and uh, held to be appropriate within an institution. Most people, I believe in original good, not original sin. Most, most teachers are coming to this profession to change people's lives. I think in many ways, it isn't really what you do to help them do that. We need to stop people doing things to stop them doing that. What do you believe to be the key features of a school that is SEND, SPLD, neurodiversity friendly? Well, first of all, your admissions policy. Legally, every child can come into a school. There are schools that we know of or have come across or experienced that aren't as friendly towards parents on their first meeting. These are ways in which schools can do things. We need to be right at the very beginning, openly inclusive, and make sure that is absolutely clearly understood by um, all those that live within the authority. We must make sure that when a child comes into a class, you remove concepts in the school about problem children. There are no, there's no such thing as a problem child. You know, that their child may have some problems, but the child themselves are a problem. You therefore need to put support into the classrooms so that when you're saying to everybody, if your child comes to us and they have some issues, we have the resources to deal with them. The coral reef exploded with colour. From his point so of this view. group are very busy at work. Every classroom has a full-time classroom assistant, so the teachers are supported in that way. The teachers, even when the children are out of the classroom in their focus group, the teacher remains responsible for that child, because there's a great danger in the system. Nobody is responsible for them. Nobody is, they say, well, it's not my fault, they're in the other class. The teacher remains responsible. So if a child goes to a focus group and doesn't respond to what we're doing, the teacher has the perfect right to say to the head teacher, that's not working. We need to think of a different way with that child. Now, there will be some children, and a lot of children, who need more than focus groups. So our focus group teachers in the afternoon do one-to-one -one interventions with six full-time teachers doing one-to-one -one interventions with children who haven't understood something that morning. 
What about the physical things, the, the school environment, what goes on in the classrooms and so on? Yeah, there are some physical things. You need to create a curriculum which actually has differentiation in it. You need to have a curriculum that is doable that you aren't asking teachers to do things that require them to work all evening or weekends because they'll just walk away. You also sometimes need to do things physically with the building, like creating small group rooms so that when a child needs an intervention, you know, there is a place to go. They're not put in the staff room or in the corner of some inappropriate room because what that does is tells them, actually, I'm a second-class citizen. Now, that doesn't mean you can do that tomorrow. What you have to do is have a dream, a vision, of that's what you want to do. So we've got 961. Working with children who have dyslexia or whatever, it isn't about reading, writing alone. It's about actually access to the curriculum. So if you're doing mathematics, you know, there'll be issues with mathematics and there's issues with writing and reading around mathematics. So this group here are also doing exactly the same task with that thorny issue of long division. You might not think it's a good idea, but the nation decides it's a good idea, so long division is what they get. So they are all getting tutoring in here, exactly the same lessons with the rest of the class once again. You also need to have structures around your um, people that are leading this because you need expertise on the staff. So staff training is terribly important. And how do you monitor and, and adapt that process? The, in, in CPD, what we do is we ask teachers what we can do to help them because uh, they themselves will have a view on what they need to support themselves. But we also have institutional um, um, programs and institutional names. So every child, every teacher here will be involved in CPD around uh, the SEND. And we will be making sure that every teacher has that expertise either from outside of the school, often from within, because if you build up a team of experts, then actually working alongside others is often a very effective way of doing it. But you do need to monitor that and you need to make sure that there are results from it. Every head teacher will go and watch teachers teach, not as part of their appraisal, but part of just the general running of the school. A key question to ask a teacher when you go into a classroom is, tell me about the children you're worried about. Now, if a teacher can't give you that answer without finding a piece of paper to find out who they're worried about, I would suggest they aren't worried about them. So there's quite deep this, that you, teachers are, should be sensitive. But if you give a class, a teacher, 35 teachers in the ch children in the class, very few facilities, hardly any time for training, no time off, and then expect them to come up with high expectations, that is what causes a teacher to say, I don't like challenging children. In what ways do you find that uh, a strong um, SEND neurodiversity policy helps the whole school? Well, you've got a policy, you know where you're going, it's as simple as that. Uh, being nice and being friendly and putting your head on one side and saying we love these children, we're going to help them, is great, but it doesn't lead you anywhere. What you've got to do is have a policy, a direction, which is infinitely adaptable as, you know, as research indicates that certain things are going to be more profitable routes to go down than others. You need to make sure, if you know where you're going, who you're going to, who's going to help you, what outside help you need, which people you're going to get advice from. Um, the policy is everything. Policy means you know where you're going. And without that, I mean, you, go, you end up going exactly where you are, nowhere. Are there tangible benefits, do you think, for all the children and, and their parents as well? Oh, absolutely. Most of us um, have been relatively successful at school and sometimes it's very easy to understand what it must feel like to be a child in a classroom where you have six hours of compulsory activity a day and it's a challenge for you and you are desperately worrying about the moment when a teacher asks you a question. Sometimes children in that situation, instead of being laughed at, they will create the opportunity to be laughed at themselves. They'll become the joker in the class. It's better to be laughed at on your terms than on someone else's terms. Sometimes it's even easier to be outside of the classroom than to be in it, and it's easy to get put outside of the classroom. Now, what we must say is we must be cleverer than that, not put children into difficult situations, but also not, not remove from them the challenge of learning. And it's that subtlety, it's a great art. That's the art of teaching. We don't give children what they want. We give children what they need. 
the greatest teachers want children to want what they need. Of all the SCND best practice measures you've introduced within the school, which do you feel have had the most impact and why? Um, well, there are two, really. Um, one is, I've mentioned the cultural bit, making sure that it's deep in people's minds. The second one is making physical um, um, opportunities for teachers to do something about it, providing the resources to help them learn. Those resources include the training, the books, classroom assistance, and in our particular case, um, built a part of the building where the children can go out and be withdrawn from the classroom for some of their activities. This has made it possible. But the, only, the most important one is the cultural one, but the physical things are just, I can't emphasize how important that is. When you're a teacher and you're working under strain, you need help. Institutions should be helping teachers teach, not having a view of um, how it might work, what they should be saying. Listen to the teachers and say to them. We say to our teachers, every year we have a question that goes around, and one of the questions is, how can we help you be more effective? Because if you listen to teachers, they'll tell you. And what we mustn't do is tell them how they could be more effective ask them how they can be more effective, and then help them do it, and then it's perfectly reasonable to demand they're more effective. What do you think needs to be done to improve awareness and acceptance of the term neurodiversity going forward? Well, uh, the point about this is that um, there are a group of people uh, in the world who believe, uh, and we hear it not always at low levels in, in society. People think there are no, it's all uh, a little bit of nonsense really and that the children just need to get on with it and to be told what's it. What we need to do is, I, I, it, cultural, 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 talk, 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 bring in experts to talk to staff, bring in people who know more about this area of um, learning and, and human development than we do. As teachers are, we have a basic training and then a lot of our training after that comes from experience. What good schools do are bringing in that training experience after initial training. So you bring in people, you talk about it, you listen to people, and then you practice from what they, the, the things that they've told you to do. It is always a challenge because people always want to go for the simple answer. I have to say there are some answers to learning which aren't simple with some children. They aren't so complex they can't be dealt with, but we do need to understand that we, as teachers, don't know all the answers. That's the key. So what, in your view, are the three most essential characteristics of a successful school leader? Uh, you have to have enthusiasm, you have to have drive, and you have to have a vision. Simple as that? Well, it's not as simple as that. It's as complex as that. Um, you won't get a vision unless you... You need to think very hard about the process. And you need to know where you're going because problems never come in in nicely packaged bundles with a nicely packaged solution. Pa problems come in at, at, at sort of from the side. They come in from... Now, if a problem comes in or an issue comes in which is not very straightforward, unless you know where you're going, it can blow you off course. You need to know where you're going, but you need to be able to not put that vision down as some dictate that only you know best and everybody's got to do what you do. Any vision a HES teacher comes from the collective wisdom of all the experiences they've had, including their school at the moment. I suppose, and this isn't meant to be anything other, as head teachers need to display a wisdom which actually is quite extraordinary in society because what they have to do is a wisdom about themselves, about what they're capable of doing, how to get staff together, how to deal with very complex needs of children. Um, we are, um, you know, the last of the Mughal emperors in some sense because we tend to have control over everything, but the great head teachers don't take control in that way. The control is done through the vision. And then, of course, the tenacity and pushing it through. And also saying that some things are so important that we will not compromise on them. But you have to be so careful with that because sometimes what you could do is actually uh, get in, 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 up sort of side roads where actually you've got yourself to believe you think it, but no one else does. And the constant thing about this is we're always learning. New things are coming in all the time. Great leaders. Um, 
are looking over the horizon and watching for the top of a mast of the ship that's coming next week. Managers manage what happened last year.